All right, hey everyone, welcome back to PT Final Exam. Just thought I'd talk about some forefoot and rear foot deformities. This is something we didn't have a chance to get to in some of our live sessions. So I thought I'd take just a moment and explain this. I know this is one that is tricky for a lot of students. And so we'll try to make this as simple as possible. I'll talk about the different deformities and the different interventions that can be used to correct these deformities or to compensate for them. And we'll try to talk through each of those. And remember, it's kind of a tricky topic. So I do recommend that you spend a little time just observing, looking at the, at the schematics for hind foot and forefoot varus and valgus. And I'll try to show it all and draw it for you. And uh, then you can come back and watch this as many times as you want. So let's talk first about the definitions of what it means to have a forefoot or a rear foot valgus or varus. And so we look at these images. We'll start first with the forefoot valgus. So forefoot valgus, this just means that the forefoot is everted. So if we look at the forefoot valgus, it's almost like the fifth ray is higher than the first ray. So you have this skiwampus movement that occurs in the coronal plane as you talk about the transverse or the coronal plane when we consider the rotation that's occurring in inversion eversion. So it's as if the first ray is plantar flexed and the fifth ray is dorsiflexed. Forefoot varus, this is the case where you have the great toe is too high. So you have a dorsiflexed first ray as compared to a plantar flexed first ray. So dorsiflexed first ray and a plantar flexed fifth ray creating the basically the presentation of an inverted forefoot. Then we get to the rear foot. The rear foot, we have rear foot valgus. Rear foot valgus, this is where the rear foot is everted, and that's being shown here. The rear foot is being everted. And then finally, rear foot varus, this is where it is too far inward or inverted, where the rear foot is too far in, or is an inversion. Now, just of note, this is the most common one. You'll see this in the clinic more often than anything, the rear foot varus. Now, it is important to define our terms here a bit. When we're talking about forefoot valgus varus and rear foot valgus varus, we're talking about positions of the foot, the rear foot and the forefoot, all while the subtalar joint is in the neutral position. All while the subtalar joint is in the neutral position. So what does that mean? That just means that at rest, non-weight bearing, open kinetic chain, you just put the leg, it rested off the edge of the table. This is what you will observe in the foot. These are deformities, meaning they are not anatomic normal. These would be anatomic anomalies where you'd see the calcaneus is too far in, the calcaneus is too far out, or the forefoot has a first ray that's too high or a first ray that's too low. So again, all of these are defined with the subtalar joint in neutral. So very often you'll assess these with the patient in prone. So patient prone with their leg hanging off the edge of the table. So you get the, the tibia, and the, and the tibia and the talus lined up, get that the ankle joint into neutral, and so and then have the subtalar joint in the neutral position, and then you observe to see if the calcaneus is deviated medially, laterally, or if the forefoot is too high or too low. So again, forefoot valgus is an eversion of the forefoot. Forefoot varus is an inversion of the forefoot. So in my mind, forefoot varus looks a lot like genuverum kind of the bow-legged look, think of it like a bow-toed look, <laughs> whereas the forefoot valgus, it's kind of like your knock need. It's coming down in like genu valgus. I don't know, probably the silliest thing to, to think about there. And then rear foot valgus varus, they follow a very similar trajectory. The rear foot valgus looks a lot like genu valgum, where your knock need, and rear foot varus looks like genu varus or genu varum, where the, you have the bow-legged look. All right, let's talk briefly about some of the interventions now. And this is the part that this is the part where most people get just a little bit confused talking about whether to add a wedge or a post. Now, usually we'll talk about wedging. So wedging is when you change the actual shoe. So we're talking about the rubber on the sole of the shoe. That's technically the wedge. A post can have the same effect, but the post is placed in the orthotic inside the shoe. So think of that as, as if you're putting the orthotic in the shoe, that's the post. And the wedge is on the outside of the shoe. But bottom line, they have the exact same effect. It's just a matter of where you put the thing. So medial wedge, as you can imagine, if we look at the different conditions here, we'll start first with a flexible rear foot valgus. So let's look at the rear foot valgus one more time. So a rear foot valgus, in the case of a flexible rear foot valgus, what does that mean by flex? What do we mean by flexible? So a flexible rear foot valgus means that there is still some joint mobility. So you can still move the joints. We're talking about the subtalar joint, the ankle joint, 
there is not a rigidity or solidity to the rear foot or to the subtalar joint. So in the case that you have a flexible rear foot valgus, a medial wedge, I'll try to draw that here, a medial wedge is going to push the foot back into a more normal alignment so that the plantar surface of the foot strikes the ground more evenly. You can imagine if you're trying to walk in this everted position, this is very much a pro over pronated position. It's technically not pronation, but it, it would create over pronation because the driving force of the tibia is coming down. It's going to cause an increase in pronation. You want to put it back into a more neutral alignment where the plantar surface touches the floor. And so then you don't have strange wearing on the plantar surface of the metatarsals. You get a better push off. You don't have as much internal external rotation of the tibia just makes everyone happier. So in the case of a flexible rear foot valgus, you'll do a medial wedge. So you can see how you're correcting it. And so I'm going to put that here. We're going to correct the problem. But let's say that we have instead, so uh, what would be a good example here? Well, I'll hold off on talking about a rigid version because it's, it's not really discussed in the literature, but we'll follow our logical sequence here down the road. Let's move now to our rigid rear foot varus. So in the case of a rigid rear foot varus, so let's talk about a rigid or a fixed, you could say it's a fixed rear foot varus, a medial wedge is going to compensate. So we'll put a medial wedge and it's going to compensate. What it does is it fills in the gap or the void. So that's why I put here, fills the gap underneath the medial surface of the foot. So in a case of a rigid or fixed rear foot varus, you'll place this medial wedge. And the only reason is so that your plantar surface of the foot comes in contact. And so you don't have this because the plantar surface of the foot is going to try to come down to the surface of the ground. It's going to try to get that, which would cause over pronation again. And so that medial wedge is going to assist in compensating for the rigid rear foot varus. So it's filling the gap, also known as compensating. So then we have the rigid forefoot varus. So rigid forefoot varus. Let's talk now over here rigid forefoot varus. In the case of a rigid forefoot varus, you can see that we have the same problem. So in the case of a rigid forefoot varus, we're going to place a medial wedge. So the medial wedge, its job is going to fill the gaps. We're talking about rigid, so we're not, there's not a lot of flexibility or pliability here. So placing that medial wedge has the same effect as with the rear foot varus. With the forefoot varus, we're going to fill the gap, and this is going to compensate. It's going to compensate for the problem by filling in the space, medial wedge. It's going to fill in the space on the medial side of the foot and compensate for it. All right, so that's our, we've talked now about medial wedging. We're going to switch ink color here, and we'll go to, let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, talk about some lateral wedging. So when we talk about lateral wedging, what we're talking about in the case of a fixed forefoot valgus, so if we have a fixed forefoot valgus, we're going to place a lateral wedge for the same reason. Fixed forefoot valgus, we will fill the space with a lateral wedge. You see, as you fill the space, it's going to compensate or fill in that space. Because otherwise, you'd have uneven wear on your metatarsal heads. You'd be unable to, you wouldn't be pushing off properly off of all of the metatarsal heads. So you'd have uneven wear on the first and second metatarsal heads. And then finally, so that was for our fixed forefoot valgus. And finally, for our flexible forefoot varus, so in the case of a flexible, flexible forefoot varus, we're going to use a lateral wedge. And in this case, we're trying to correct the problem. Correct the problem. So if you place a lateral wedge, what that does is it pushes the toes back up into a more neutral position so that 
all all five rays touch this touch the surface at the exact same time. So it's going to correct the problem. So those are the ones that are discussed in the literature as far as uh, my primary resource here is O'Sullivan's physical rehabilitation, the section on orthotics, as well as Dutton's physical or orthopedic examination, uh, examination, diagnosis, and intervention, examination, evaluation, intervention. So we've got Dutton and O'Sullivan as the primary resources. Now, if you want to follow this to its logical conclusion, you could also talk about how in the case of a rigid rear foot valgus, you could technically put a lateral wedge in, but it's not described because the problem with the lateral wedge is going to push you more into pronation. So you, we usually don't talk about this one because it's not really going to solve too many problems. And then in the case of a flexible rear foot varus, you could see how a lateral wedge would push you back into the correct position or would help correct the position. So technically you could put a lateral wedge for a flexible rear foot varus. So just back to the ones they're most likely to talk with you about, it's usually gonna be something like forefoot varus or rear foot varus. So we got forefoot varus and rear foot varus. These ones are the most likely ones to show up on the test. And the reason is just simply that uh, they're very common and they're easily fixed by putting in that medial wedge. If you put in that medial wedge, we'll switch back to the red ink. But if you put in that medial wedge, it's going to fill in the space on that on both the fixed forefoot varus and rear foot varus. These are the ones you really need to know. Kind of of note, this is just kind of an interesting note. If, if you did not correct the forefoot varus or the rear foot varus, the plantar surface of the foot is going to try to hit the ground. And you can imagine that would, you know, that's what gravity is going to be doing is in a closed kinetic chain, you're going to try to hit the ground. The trouble with doing so is it's going to drag the whole foot into a pronated position. Now that over pronation, it's going to be very difficult for your, because there's a lot of airspace there. And so it travels a great distance. And so the muscle that controls pronation, the tibialis posterior. So if you recall, the tibialis posterior is an inverter muscle. So it creates supination. And so it eccentrically resists pronation as you go into during initial contact, you pronate a bit. The tibialis posterior acts eccentrically to control that. You will overload the tibialis posterior with excessive pronation. So all of this, well, especially if we talked about, uh, yeah, the forefoot varus and the rear foot varus, if unchecked, will lead to tibialis posterior. So tibialis posterior overloading. So that would be a classic NPT style question. Where they talk about the tibialis posterior. What does it do? Tibialis posterior travels around the backside of the medial malleolus and it, it is an inverter and supinator, but its primary job is to control pronation and eversion, eccentrically controlling pronation. So tibialis posterior, its job is to eccentric control of pronation. So there you go, a little bit of an in and out, uh, the, all the ins and outs related to the forefoot and rear foot, varus and valgus. Hopefully that helps talking about how you correct these things. Again, these ones that are listed on this slide, these are the ones that are described by O'Sullivan in the orthotics chapter, as well as Dutton talking about the different types of forefoot and rear foot valgus and varus. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. And uh, like I said, please let us know if you have any questions or reach out, be happy to help. Talk to you soon. We'll print fist bumps all around.